Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, a little art history, alternate universes and Marlon Brando. First, we speak to an art curator about what he thinks biennials should be. Then, are you bored of reality? A new art show offers different dimensions. And we look back at the only film ever directed by Marlon Brando. Writer and curator Paco Barragan says biennials are thought to be where art history is written, but more and more where cash is being made. His book, From Roman Feria to Global Art Fair, offers a historical perspective on art fairs and biennials going all the way back to ancient Greece. It deals with the contradictions and complexities of these cultural events, which he says have become tools of soft power. So let's talk to Paco Barragan, who joins me now from Oviedo, Spain. Hi there, it's lovely to have you with us today. So, you talk about fairization of biennials and biennialization of art fairs. Well, that was a tough one. Tell us what you mean by that. Yes, hi, how are you? Yeah, it's a little bit tricky, but it's a perfect uh, uh, reflection of what's happening today. There are two basic ideas behind my book. The first one is uh, that we live in, in today's culture capitalism, where cities compete really hard for global attention. And they compete for high-end tourism. And in this, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a pop concert or a, a sports event. In this uh, scene, high, uh, art fairs and biennials are really uh, extremely um, high-end competitive tools to position yourself because they are aimed, as you know, at uh, high-end tourism. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap tourism. And the second idea behind my book is that, well, to us, to all of us, it's clear that an art fair has to do with sales, with the art market and commodification. And on the contrary, a biennial has to do with art history and with disinterestedness, the reality is much more complex. And this is why I talk about the biennialization of art fairs and the variation of biennials, because in a way, art fairs like to present themselves as uh, biennials, mm -hmm. and biennials mm -hmm. uh, act de facto as art fairs. So what you mean is that Venice Biennial and Documenta, I mean, these kind of like prestigious biennials, they are about theory and art history, whereas, I don't know, fairs like Art Basel, for example, is about practice and art market. This is some sort of a belief that everyone in the art world, to an extent, would have, I assume. So you don't believe this kind of a dichotomy to be true anymore? Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Let's, for example, uh, if we start with, with art fairs, like, like uh, um, Basel. How do you present art fairs themselves? They behave like biennials. How, how do they do that? How they try to achieve credibility? By having special curated sections, which is more of a biennial. By having sections with seminars, conferences, and so on. By even attracting people like, for example, Art Basel, the general director is Mark Spiegler. He was the art critic of Art Forum. Uh, the Art Basel America's director is Noah Horowitz. He is an art historian. So they are in, in, uh, attracting intellectual capital and they present themselves much more than just a sales opportunity. They, they organize sophisticated panels, seminars, uh, curated sections. Actually, uh, it's very interesting because uh, the section Art Unlimited at Art Basel, which is for big artworks, uh, the former director, uh, he really explained that that uh, this section came about because he saw that Venice Biennial, the dealers were selling the artworks mm -hmm. in front at, at, at the same Biennial. So they said, OK, we have to come up with something to compete with this Biennial. And this is how in 2000 Art Unlimited uh, it came to existence. 
On the other hand, you know very well that once a curator selects an artist, there is this tandem of, for, for the Venice by Biennale or Documenta, then you get this team of the art dealer, curator, museum institution that produce the artwork, that transport the artwork, that present the artwork. And it means that being presented at these special uh, and uh, really relevant art historical platforms, mm -hmm. the artwork also gets commodified because okay. it's, it's, it, it, uh, it is... It achieves more more value, you know. So, and also, um, what's Paco, interesting can I cut is you off there because this is an interesting point. You sort of summarized, uh, you know, yes. your 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 yes. idea. I wonder whether you think this is a bad thing or not. Are you suggesting that it should be different? Biennials have different should have different rules, and they should, you know, act in a different way and sort of reinvent themselves, perhaps. Well, I don't think it's it's a good or bad thing. I just think that it's a reflection of the contradictions and complexity mm -hmm. of today's mm -hmm. new capitalism. But let me give you one one idea that's that's very interesting that people uh, uh, don't recall or not everybody knows. The Venice Biennale had a, a sales office between 1942 and 1968. Mm -hmm. There was uh, an official dealer, Ettore Gian Ferrari, that charged 15% for the Biennale and 2% for himself. Okay, Paco, so, uh, uh, we don't have much yes. time left. So, this okay. sort of commodification, do you think it's escapable, escapable in the neoliberal heyday we're in right now? No, not at all. I think that uh, it's not at all. It's just part of our, of our uh, uh, a daily uh, professional artwork. And we have, what I think is that we have to come up with different ideas of interpreting, analyzing and confronting this situation. This black and white art history, this art market, uh, disinterestedness versus this, doesn't work any longer. The situation is just too complex. We need uh, to develop more interesting and sophisticated ways of analysis. It means that this is what's happening and it will be even uh, more complex. So there is no, biennials are not bad and or are good and art fairs are bad. Mm -hmm. This is uh, outdated 20th century <laughs> analysis. Okay. We have to understand the contradiction and complexity of today's art world, which is very sophisticated, as you know. All right, Paco Barragan, it was lovely having you today. Thanks a lot for joining us. A new show in New York City blends math and art. It also offers its weavers the opportunity to step into a new dimension. But don't say I didn't warn you, the installation is not for those with vertigo. Fractals can most easily be described as mathematical equations which express themselves as infinitely repeating patterns. And if an artist chooses to run them through a computer software program, these endless series of numbers become something entirely different and unique. This is how digital artist Julius Horsius created geometric properties. This exhibition at the Artec House in New York's Chelsea Market takes its visitors into an entirely otherworldly journey. Julius, as, as I know, came across fractals while doing research for a separate project and instantly felt a connection with them. Um, he was fascinated by how through mathematics you could take someone on a journey through almost an entirely new world. Geometric Properties combines the artist's fractal creations with cutting edge technology to create an immersive experience. It does feel like it takes you to a completely new world or a new place altogether. Um, and I think our hope is that, you know, folks that see this installation will, um, you know, have a moment of kind of self-reflection and hopefully they leave feeling a bit inspired and, and maybe even optimistic, uh, a little bit more optimistic than we've been in the last year as we move forward. Al Baghizi also says art can be both an escape and a refuge during these pandemic times. 
And it looks like the show has achieved its purpose, with many visitors saying they don't want to leave this geometrically friendly dimension anytime soon. the height of his power, Marlon Brando could have done anything. So, this icon of mafia bosses directed a western. In today's movie almanac, we go back 60 years to the release of One-Eyed Jacks and look at why Brando would never sit back down in the director's chair. I mean that everything I told you last night was a lie. It all lies. You lie? One-Eyed Jacks tells a tale of betrayal between two men. After a robbery in Mexico, the older criminal, played by Carl Malden, takes off with the money. Marlon Brando, his captured partner, escapes and tries to find him in California. For Brando, this was a vanity project. It was going to be the first film to be released by his own production company, Pennebaker Incorporated. To lend the movie prestige, Stanley Kubrick was hired to direct. Brando was to play the lead, and writing duties were handed out to then-up-and-coming filmmaker Sam Peckinpah. It looked like a great deal, but according to John Baxter's biography of Kubrick, he accepted the job to keep a good relationship with Brando, but didn't like the script, and Peckinpah was let go. Later, on the grounds of creative differences, Kubrick also left the project. Brando had to take charge both in front of the camera and behind it. In its long production history, the film went over budget and fell behind schedule, taking nine months to complete. By the time One Night Jax was in the editing stage, Brando was in Sidney Lumet's The Fugitive Kind. He had to fly from New York to California to oversee post-production. But instead of going with Brando's cut, Paramount Pictures released their own version of the film. At this point, One Night Jax was taken away from the actor-director, despite his star power. Brando called the experience exhausting and was so discouraged that he never sat back into the director's chair again. Not as long as I breathe. While many museums have been organizing virtual tours since COVID-19 broke out, Others want to introduce you to a docent, with a few screws loose. Zeynep Gökçe has the story. It all started in 2014, when Take Britain allowed visitors to explore its art galleries at night via remote-controlled robots. Not so long after, the Van Abba Museum in the Netherlands started doing the same as a way to help out art enthusiasts with physical disabilities who weren't able to visit their space. But ever since COVID-19 came into the picture, these telepresence robots are attracting more museums that want to offer more than just a virtual tour, but a real-time experience. Miami's Avant Gallery is one of them. They invite you to jump into the body of their robots to explore their physical galleries. Same goes for the UK-based Hastings Contemporary. It's like video conferencing on a, on a Segway. Uh, so it looks like an I, iPad and it looks like a Segway and it moves around. It's actually uh, much more dexterous than it might first appear. So it has a zoom that can go in and out and a neck that extends up and down and it can be manoeuvred on, on fairly level ground, uh, very, very capable, it's very capable. And you don't have to do it alone. Your family or friends can join you along the way. This robot can take five people, five screens, so five living rooms together on a tour around the gallery. 
That could be a classroom for schools, it could be a family group at home, or it could be one person by themselves, bedridden, who can jump on board via the robot, via their own computer screen, and allow us to drive them around the gallery, or indeed, one of them can be the driver. In this case, the driver was the museum's visitor services manager, Rowan Bunny. We're an art gallery and we're here to display what we have to our visitors. It's no substitute for seeing them in the real, but at least it, it gives people the opportunity to get a bit of a, an insight and a, and a bit of a sneaky peek at, at what we've got on display. But even when COVID-19 is no longer a threat, Hastings Contemporary has no intention of ditching the robots. And that's not such a big surprise. Artificial intelligence is taking over more jobs for people. There are even plans for a robot to curate the next Bucharest Biennial in 2022. So maybe the coronavirus is not the only thing museum employees should be worried about. The journey of humanity by British artist Sacha Jaffrey has sold for $62 million in Dubai. It's one of the most expensive paintings sold at auction by any living artist. Here is more on that. The aim was always to change the lives of children around the world and try and reconnect humanity for a better, more empathetic, more loving, more united tomorrow. Um, I didn't dream this would happen. Um, it's happened. Kinetic art was popularized after World War II. That's unless you're Russian. The movement never found its footing in the Soviet Union. But a new exhibition is trying to make up for that. Nursen Altutar has more. Moscow's Tretyakov Gallery stimulates its visitors with the exhibition Laboratory of the Future – Kinetic Art in Russia. Around 400 works incorporate some kind of movement. This is called kinetic art, and the curator says it's been neglected in Russia's contemporary art scene. If you open any book written on the history of art by our researchers, you will see that only one and a half pages are dedicated to kinetic art, and sometimes it is missed out altogether. Our exhibition shows first of all new names, presents works of well-known artists who were forgotten, and follows the absolutely new link of art development between avant-garde, contemporary and experiments of the 1960s. There are four sections in the exhibition, all dedicated to different dynamics in the kinetic art movement. Color tables delve into the color perceptions. Art metrics demonstrate works based on calculations. Laboratory of Environment displays works in the field of design and performing arts. And the final section, Synesthesia, mixes several senses together. For very many artists, it's interesting to explore this particular opportunity, to look at different ways of perception to expand the boundaries of perception and to start hearing the visible, to see the hearable, to touch both. In this sense, this technology that lets us hear the color or see the sound, it becomes a very interesting object of artistic investigation. During the Soviet Union, art movements such as avant-garde and social realism were popular. 
Now, the curators of this exhibition hope that kinetic art will inject some fresh blood into the Russian contemporary art scene. Now, despite a war going on in Syria, a young calligrapher is using the streets of Damascus as his canvas. That's despite having zero training. Here's his story. Hazem Crudeli started practicing calligraphy in 2015. He did so all by himself, without knowing how it was done. His first creations were on paper, but he wanted to go bigger, so he hit the streets of Damascus. Kurdali's latest mural is located in the Old City. It depicts Saladin, the founder of the Ayyubid dynasty, which ruled large parts of the Middle East in the 12th and 13th centuries. Kurdali says the mural highlights Syria's culture, not just the calligraphy, but the ancient buildings that they are painted on. Arabic calligraphy was always linked to Islamic art because Arabic letters are in the Quran. This is something beautiful, but now what I try to do in my art is to get out of the traditional framework to reach something more linked to plastic arts. Arabic calligraphy has a big potential because of its curves. Kurdali might be from Damascus, but his art also tries to show the relationship between his hometown and Syria's other cities. In the mural with Saladin, Kurdali exhibits not only Damascus's history, but also the entrance of the citadel in Aleppo. It thrived under the rule of Saladin and his successors. Then there is Kurdali's use of script. It depends on what fits each of us. Sometimes we use phrases from the Quran or phrases from Sufi poets like Rumi and al halaj And sometimes we just use letters. Sometimes the paintings may be just a visual installation. So what's next for Kurdali? Well, he wants to take his work into the third dimension, a relatively new practice of turning Arabic calligraphy into sculptures. When an amateur skateboarder realized he had no chance of going pro, he found another way to take his passion a step up. These used to be skateboards, but in the hands of Artyom Shitikov, they found a second life. When the Russian is not skating, he works on his old boards, and this hobby turned into the company Revived Skateboards. I have always skated, and I wanted this to be my lifestyle. It was too late to become a professional skateboarder, but I have always liked to do work with my hands. Shitikov started off by making simple items such as rings. Then he moved on to more intricate pieces, mastering new skills he learned by watching online videos and studying the products of his Western counterparts. But back then, Shitikov thought only a few people would want this stuff. In the beginning, I thought these would be guys who skate, fans of extreme sports, skateboarders, snowboarders, but it turned out that our main clients are ordinary people that have nothing to do with skateboarding, but who are interested in recycling. Buyers also like the colourful stripes, a feature that comes with the board, as manufacturers paint each layer before gluing them together. But how does Shitikov get all these boards in the first place? Well, considering how often skaters break them, there's no shortage of raw materials. Currently, he has around 200 boards sent by skateboarders from all over Russia. Skateboards are consumables and skating. They get broken all the time. For me, on average, it takes between two weeks to a month to break one. According to GreenMatters.com, 2 million skateboards are broken each year. Sadly, many go into landfills. But initiatives such as Revived Skateboards hope to change that one board at a time. And what can you say other than that's pretty gnarly?
That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.